Last lecture, we talked about the, the math and the theory behind coupled mode theory. This lecture builds on that, and we are going to talk exclusively about a whole bunch of different devices that operate based on coupled mode theory. And the devices we'll talk about, we can roughly divide into three different categories. The co-directional co devices, this is where we're coupling between two modes that are essentially traveling in the same direction. The medium period uh, grading devices, or the non-directional, where we have maybe completely different modes or modes traveling in different directions that we want to couple. And then the final one, the, the contra-directional devices, where the modes we're coupling are traveling in opposite directions. Let's talk a little bit and review what we did last time, and that'll help understand the devices we talk about in this lecture. Remember, uh, I described coupled mode theory really in terms of two waveguides coming into close proximity. And I mentioned it does not need to be modes and waveguides. It can be modes of any sort. It can be an external wave to a signal along a transmission line to pretty much anything. For me, it's probably most intuitive to understand it through the waveguide picture, so that's what I've introduced here. And so remember, we start off with two waveguides. One looked like a triangle, the other looked like a square, and they both support modes. And we did something called perturbation analysis, and we brought these in close proximity. We got this super mode, so it's one big mode, and now it looks at the triangle and square as one big strange waveguide. Perturbation analysis says those modes do not get perturbed when we bring those in close proximity. We know that's not quite physically correct, but it's close and we can get some pretty meaningful results. So what we did, we calculated mode one and mode two. So the mode and waveguide one, the mode and waveguide two, and when we brought the waveguides in close proximity, we essentially summed them and we can describe our E and H's of the super mode. But as this propagates, as a function of Z, the amplitude of that first mode and the amplitude of the second mode will change. And what we saw last time is that there's a periodic exchange of energy between the two. It'll, it'll bounce back and forth, if you will. So here's my cartoon picture of that. On the right, we see we have a, the first guy where we inject our energy and it propagates, but it's coupled to the second waveguide. And what we can see is that the energy eventually jumps over here. And at some point, we get 100% of the energy in the second waveguide. Well, now it's just like we injected energy into the first waveguide. And if we keep going, the energy will go back and it'll bounce back and forth. And ignoring losses, that will go on indefinitely. And if we look at the response of this, we see that the exchange of power between the waveguides follows a cosine type profile. We're looking at the power bouncing back and forth between the two waveguides. This is a movie of directional coupling. And I'm not sure if this will render correctly, but hopefully it will. Uh, but what, we, what I'm illustrating here is the energy in one waveguide couples to the other, but disappears from the first waveguide, and then that would go back again. And that process would repeat itself. I'll play that one more time. So anyway, that is my illustration of directional coupling. We also talked about mode coupling versus butt coupling. Butt coupling is where we have this end fire condition. We have a discrete start of some waveguide. There's an electromagnetic field out here and it hits the interface of that guide. So some of that sort of end fires into the mode supported by this waveguide. That is called butt coupling. We also have where we have the two waveguides next to each other where we get this slow leaking of the power from one waveguide into the other. That's the mode coupling. And so we differentiate the two. We made a series of approximations and we came to the, the simplified version of the coupled mode equations. And then from that we looked at two different cases. The co-directional coupling which is where the modes we're coupling between are traveling in the same direction and the contra-directional coupling is where the modes that we're coupling are traveling in opposite directions like in Bragg gratings. 
Okay, so on to the co-directional devices. And the first one, and by far the most common, is something called the directional coupler. So here's what happens. Um, we will inject power into a first wave guide. So we see we have a mode here, and I'm drawing that there's zero amplitude in the second guide. Well, we know that there's this magical difference where 100% of the energy will jump into the other guide. Well, suppose we only went halfway. And now half of the energy is in the second guide and half is still in the first. We could split these waveguides at this point and we've made a 50-50 splitter or more commonly called this is a 3 dB directional coupler and we would use this to split the signal. Now we could also cut off this coupler somewhere in the middle. We would have a 6 dB coupler and we could cut it off way back here where we only have the minutest amount of energy here. A lot of times something like that is used where we couple off just 10 or 20 dB of a signal and the reason we couple off so little is maybe we want to measure the signal but not hog a lot of power from it. So for a test port or something like that. So at microwave frequencies uh, we can do the same thing. Here we have transmission lines. So we have a coax to microstrip transition. So we have a microstrip transmission line that then goes to the output. However, we have another transmission line running in parallel to that. And guess what? Those are coupled. And if we inject a signal in this, on the left-hand side here, we will couple a second signal out here. Now this one is designed to only couple off about 3% of the energy. Why just 3%? Because this is probably just testing the signal. We just want to measure the signal there but not really take too much energy from it to change any kind of signal to noise ratio. And it works the other way. Uh, same device, if we injected energy from the left, uh, energy would come out here. Again, we're coupling out about 3%. Most of the energy just keeps going. So this is really just probably being used for testing applications. Folks use directional coupling at optical frequencies too. Here we have two optical waveguides in close proximity. We see that we have a photonic crystal lattice extending around it, and that's probably doing something to the direction coupling, probably enhancing it or controlling it in some way. But there will be still a periodic exchange of energy between these two guides. And we can split energy, we can probe energy, do a lot of different things. So here's a, a crazy concept that we dreamed up when I, when I worked for a company called Prime Photonics based on this directional coupling. Imagine we have an optical fiber and we polish it in half and see the little tiny black speck here. That's the core and that's really about the size of a core in what's called a single mode optical fiber. Well suppose we want to build a bunch of sensors or chemical experiments. We think we could actually integrate all of this onto the side of the fiber. Well how would we do this? Well how about directional coupling to get the light out? So we have a waveguide going down the fiber. We could fabricate or manufacture another waveguide very close to it. So if we pump light in here from the right, it would slowly couple into this green waveguide. Then we can pull it away from the core so there's no more coupling. We could do some kind of experiment, make the light sensitive to something happening, and then inject the signal back in. And we could do a whole bunch of experiments down the length of an optical fiber. We never took this concept too far, but this really should be possible. And we could get light in and out of the fiber using directional coupling. Next co-directional device, the coupled line filter. So here's a movie of the concept and this actually used the beam propagation method to model this. And what we see is that we have a wave that's injected from the left. It is coupled into the next waveguide and we've spaced this so that the spacing is perfect so that we couple 100 percent of the energy into the adjacent waveguide or very close to it and there's minimal scattering. So what would happen is we get essentially 100 percent transmission through this device. Now I don't have a movie of it but if we injected it with a, a, a frequency or wavelength that doesn't match that condition, it's slightly different, we would get much more scattering and not get 100 percent transmission. So this really is a bandpass filter. If it doesn't match that condition at that specific wavelength, it would get filtered out and the energy would be scattered out of the guides.
so I have still pictures of it. Uh, here's a filter that has two intermediate segments and an input and an output guide. And this is dead on the matched wavelength. Well, if we have a wavelength that's slightly different than that, what we see is we get a lot more scattering and we get much more weaker coupling through. So that's producing the filtering mechanism. We can see that we, we, the number of strips, parallel strips, is called the order of the filter. And what we can see from this data is that we, in, as we increase the number, the position of the bandpass filter doesn't change. That makes sense. But the width changes. The more lines we use, the narrower that filter. So both plots here are showing the same data. The one on the left is on a linear scale. The one on the right is on a dB scale. Here's a very similar thing implemented at microwave frequencies. So let's say our signal enters from the left and it's traveling down this transmission line, but there's another transmission line in very close proximity. So there's tight coupling here. And then there's another one of proximity, tight coupling. So this is a microwave implementation of what we've just talked about. And this also produces a bandpass filter effect. Another type of bandpass filter, um, there's hairpin turns here. And so there's actually more interfaces between waveguides and uh, we can adjust the spacing between the guides to change the coupling and, and change the width and other properties of the filter. But it's still essentially a coupled line filter. That's what's producing the filtering here. On to another type of co-directional device, something called a multi-mode interference coupler or an MMI. So imagine we have a standard waveguide and we excite it with its mode and all of a sudden it goes into a section with a super, super huge waveguide and this probably supports hundreds and hundreds of modes. So this fundamental mode comes in and it starts spreading and bouncing around and producing all kinds of crazy interference and it turns out if we go some distance we can actually make a splitter. We can split this two ways, three ways, four ways. Uh, any number way, in principle, any number. And it's, it's due to this strange interference pattern that establishes itself in that huge multi-mode waveguide. There's a picture on the following slide, so let me jump to that. So here we are, and we have our initial mode coming in. It starts to spread, and the energy looks uh, pretty well evenly distributed. There's no bright and dark spots. That's because it's not interfering with itself. But here, the energy that spreads now bounces back down and starts interfering with the power that had gone straight. So we start seeing interference patterns. And what we see is that this magical distance, this input node, mode images itself here. And in fact, if we had an output waveguide, we could couple out in principle 100% of the energy. However, that would form a filter. If the wavelength changed, this multimode interference would change, and in fact, the position where it images that original input would shift, and we wouldn't get as efficient output. Well, now let's look at about half that distance. Here's the, the input images itself perfectly. If we look at about half the distance, the input images itself twice. And if we shut off our multimode interferometer here, or multimode interference device, we could output two waveguides and have a splitter. Well, look here, there's three images and four images and so on. And in principle, we could go back and, and, and split any number of different ways. And folks have done a lot of things with this. And rather than just have rectangular cavities, there are all kinds of crazy shapes and uh, makes them very interesting and very, very compact devices. So that's the multimode interference coupler. And I think this is our last type of co-directional device, but a long period grading, which is quite interesting in optical fibers. So remember, if we are coupling between two different modes, the grading vector of the grading that couples the modes is the difference between the propagation constants. Well, if we have two modes that are very, very evenly matched, that beta one minus beta two is a very, very small number, so it's a very small grading vector, which corresponds to very long period gradings. 
So we can put these long period gratings and optical fibers and couple between forward propagating modes. So here's how we could form it. Uh, here's the construction of an optical fiber. The bulk of the size, if you touch one, is actually this uh, spongy, soft kind of polymer buffer. And that really just makes it strong so that you can handle it. And this feels like fishing line, and it looks like fishing line. On the inside of that, at about a 125 micron diameter, which is about the size of a human hair, that's the actual silica fiber. And if you look at this little tiny black speck in the middle, that's the core. And for single mode fibers, that core is usually about 10 microns. And these optical fibers for telecommunications are usually illuminated with about a 1.5 micron source. And so this is actually a very large core. It's, it's 10 microns, almost 10 wavelengths. So that's the construction of the fiber. So what is typically done is we strip away that polymer buffer we lower a mask here, and so a lot of times this is a chrome mask where the black regions would be blocking light and the clear regions would allow light to pass. And we take ultraviolet light, we shine it through that mask, and we are periodically exposing this uh, optical fiber to ultraviolet light, and in fact we end up inducing a grating. And this is not a Bragg grating, a Bragg grating couples between counter propagating waves here we want a couple between two forward propagating waves, which we'll get into. So we need two modes traveling forward. Well, what are those two modes? Well, we know that the core supports a mode because it's a high refractive index surrounded by low refractive index. So it is a waveguide. Well, the cladding region, which is very big, has a refractive index of about 1.5 and it's surrounded by air. So the cladding itself, this whole big thing, is also a waveguide. It's not a very good one and not really designed to be a waveguide, but it is one and it supports many thousands of modes, uh, maybe hundreds of thousands. So those modes look pretty crazy and there's many, many, many of them. But they're all traveling forward and their propagation constants are very close to this mode in the core. So those are the modes we're coupling between. We're coupling between this core mode and a cladding mode. So here's a movie of a long period grading in action. And what we see that the red ball is a forward wave and as it propagates it's slowly spilling energy out into this cladding mode. Now in principle, if that optical fiber were perfect, that energy in the cladding mode would couple back into the core. Well, in a practical setting, because these fibers are not designed to really support those cladding modes very well, the outside of the fiber maybe has scratches, maybe it's bent, whatever, uh, those cladding modes leak out. They really don't ever go back into the core mode, but if we had a perfectly shaped fiber, it was perfectly straight, and everything was perfect, yes, that energy would couple back into the core. Okay, so if we were to compare a conventional long period grading to what we call a turnaround long point grading, we get a very interesting effect. So a conventional long period grading couples a core mode to a cladding mode and we get some kind of response. On the, that coupling condition, when that is met, we see a, a narrow dip in transmission, and that's because the energy here is coupling into that cladding mode and essentially being lost. The rest here is not coupling to a cladding mode, so it, it is transmitted. Now with a conventional LPG, it's a, or long period grading, it's a very narrow band effect. When anything is happening to the optical fiber, the position of that shifts left and right. And so our sensor system, if you will, it has to resolve that shift in wavelength. Not such a big deal, but things can be simpler. It turns out we can look at the, the, at the phase matching curves, and there's a very interesting condition. We look at the wavelength of where this uh, matching condition happens, and the period of the grading. We see these lines, sort of uh, phase matching curves, if you will. But what we see is there's a certain point where these phase matching curves actually turn around. 
Well, if we choose that as our long period grading, um, we actually get a, a pretty broad range of where that phase matching conditions met. And rather than get this a narrow dip, we get this strong dip. Now imagine this red line moving up and down. So something's happening on the outside of the fiber which pushes this red line up and down. If we're riding across some other curve, the, the position of that intersection moves left and right. And the intersection is also very narrow. That's what's happening here. The intersection is very narrow and it moves left and right. But over here, the intersection is broad and as that red line moves up and down uh, because something's happened to the optical fiber, the position of that intersection doesn't change. We just get this broad dip just gets lower and higher. Well, now that is something very, very simple to detect and come up with a sensor response from. So these turnaround point LPGs or turnaround point long period gratings have some benefits over the conventional long period gratings in, in that regard. So one thing I did in my previous life, we were working with Virginia Tech and we were looking at these ionic self-assembled multi-layer films and they were these long polymer strands that we could functionalize on the surface of an optical fiber. They're very thin, so we'd etch a little bit of the outside of the fiber, deposit these ISAMs on the outside of the fiber and kind of bring the fiber back to where it was. But now these ISAM films are sensitive to things. And in this case, we were trying to measure pH. And when the ions were absorbed in these ISAMs, they would swell. That would change the optical properties of the optical fiber. And in fact, the properties of those cladding modes would change. It would change the phase matching condition. And we could measure that as a response in this TAP LPG sensor. So what we're looking at, this smooth gray region, that's an optical fiber. This is where the film is, and then we have air on top. So as ions were exposed to this from a pH, this film would swell. And there's other things that this could measure. And pretty much if you could make that film swell in response to something, then we could measure that optically with a response in the optical fiber. So this is how it's done. We start off here at the lower left. We have our conventional core mode. That never changes. And then we have our cladding mode. Then what we do is we start to etch the fiber. And the core mode stays the same because uh, it decays very quickly. And by the time it reaches the cladding, the, the field is incredibly small. It's incredibly small, even close to the core. So the core mode doesn't change. The cladding mode changes a little bit. There is now less material here. And so, in fact, its propagation constant lowers by just a little bit, some, some bit delta. Then, this ISAM film is grown onto the outside. And what we actually see is that the shape of this mode, uh, there's, a, there's a transfer of power just a little bit to this ISAM film because this probably has a higher refractive index than the fiber itself. But we grow this ISAM film until we bring the propagation constant back to where it was. Then if we keep growing, if a thick ISAM, in fact, its propagation constant shifts even more, and even more power has shifted to the outside of the fiber. And we can track this while it's being deposited. So if we are at the turnaround point, we choose our grading period so that we are, this is the response of the fiber as we're depositing these layers. So as we deposit more and more layers, we see this dip get stronger and stronger and stronger because we're better and better matching that phase condition and spilling off energy into this uh, the surrounding cladding. Now, if it were a perfect fiber, maybe the response wouldn't be this strong because some of that energy in the cladding would couple back into the core. But the reality is once we couple into a cladding mode, the fiber is not really designed to support those that well and they end up scattering and leaking out of the guide. And we get a nice dip response here. So here's another picture of how this works. Um, when this film is thinnest, uh, we might have the strongest coupling. So we have all the energy in the core, it spills out into the cladding, and by the time we get to the end, there, there's almost no transmission. Let's just say 1% transmission. Well, as this film thickens a little bit, the coupling's a little bit weaker, and we're starting to get a, a stronger signal at the output. And as the film grows and grows and grows, 
eventually that phase matching condition's gone. We don't couple any energy into that cladding mode and we get 100% transmission. It's acting like an ordinary fiber here. And then when the film retracts, the coupling strengthens and the transmission dips. So the fact that we relate this only to a fluctuation in, in the transmission, it's very, very easy to measure and detect. We don't have to resolve what wavelength it is or anything like that. Here's a movie of how this works. So what we can see here is that we have in gray, here's an optical fiber. You can kind of see the grading here. And we have this ISAM film. And right now, what we're showing is that all of the energy is being coupled into the cladding mode. So it spills out into the cladding mode. And so what gets transmitted in the core is very small on this phase matching condition. So here's the response curve. We had this strong dip because we're coupling into that cladding mode. Now what this movie will show, you'll see a bunch of little plus signs representing ions, and it'll rain down on this. That film will swell, that will detune the phase matching condition. We won't couple as much energy into the cladding mode and more light will come out of the core and you'll see that, that dip disappear because more light's coming out the core instead of being lost to the cladding mode. So here come those ions and the film swells, the coupling condition changes, and the dip goes away. When the ions go away, the film contracts, and we get our dip back. So that's my animation of how we make a sensor out of that. Okay, so that's it for the co-directional couplers. On to grading couplers, or let's say non-directional couplers. Um, very often we have a waveguide, and it supports a guided mode, but we need to get power into that guided mode. How on earth do we do that? So let's say we have a dielectric waveguide here, so it supports some kind of mode that looks like this, and we have this external wave, and we want to couple from one to the other. Well, we, we kind of know that we put a grating here, and now we can couple between these two modes. This, this, this plane wave will hit the diffraction grating, and it essentially diffracts that wave into an angle which by ray tracing is a supported mode and that's how it works and it works both ways if we hit that same grading with the guided mode first it will come out as an external wave so this is bi-directional and this is how we get or very often we get energy in and out of waveguides another way we've already talked about we can put a second waveguide up against this one and directionally couple into it but what if we have an external wave and we can't do a directional coupling? Here's how we would do it, through a grating coupler. Then there's a concept called apodizing, and we can make apodized gratings. So if we think of this diffraction grating as always, maybe every period leaks out 1% of the power. So that means if each period is leaking out the same fraction of power, that would mean we'd have some portion of power coming out here, the rest propagates along, but we have less power here. So 1% of less power is less power. And what we get is less energy or power coming out of the waveguide as a function of distance. Now I've exaggerated. This is probably happens over 100 periods or so. But what we see is we get an asymmetric output and we get this lopsided beam. And that's rarely desirable. Lopsided beams don't propagate the way we want to, they diffract more than we want to, they don't focus the way we want them to. So what can we do about that? Well, we can do something called apodization, where we in some way make the diffraction grating weaker here. So we have this mode, it's at strongest right here, so we only couple out a little bit. Now as that mode gets weaker and weaker and weaker, we'll strengthen the grating so that we outcouple a greater portion of less power, such that overall we get a uniform amount of power coming out of this grating. And now we have a very desirable beam pattern that propagates well, it focuses well, and uh, this is very common. This is another type of grating coupler that, that I was designing to try to get light out of an optical fiber very, very fast. And what I saw, I polished the fiber, and I brought an ordinary grating coupler in proximity to the fiber and what happened is this grating coupler perturbed the field and in fact the mode in that fiber shifted away and once the power in the fiber shifted away it never saw the grating to outcouple 
power. I only got a little bit of power out coupled here uh, and then nothing contributed. So I did not get light out of the fiber very effectively at all. The next thing I tried was sort of an on-off grating. I duty cycled the grating. I had, you know, maybe 10 or 20 teeth and then air. 10 or 20 teeth and then air. And so what happens is uh, the, the mode comes along, it sees the grating, it starts to move away, but by the time it moves an appreciable amount away, uh, I stop the grating. And so then the mode can actually come back and then outcouple a little bit more. And then as the mode starts to move away, I stop the grating and, and so on. And so using a, a pretty simple optimization algorithm, you can come up with an optimal duty cycle. And in fact, I got light out of this fiber about an order of magnitude faster than, than anything else I found in the literature. So here's a completely different way to couple two waveguides. What we talked about earlier was bringing the waveguides in close enough proximity that we can directionally couple from one to the other. Well, suppose they're very far apart. What also can be done, we can put a grating in one of the waveguides to couple the guided mode into an external beam, and then a second grating in a second waveguide couples this external beam back into a guided mode. So we can actually couple energy between waveguides that are very far away simply by coupling into an external wave. And here's one of the earlier papers describing going from an optical fiber to an integrated optical waveguide using this. And here's a neat grating that uh, is actually done reasonably common. But what we see, it, it's called a, a focusing grating coupler. And at the top is our optical waveguide. And we would shine a beam down onto this region. But the beam's probably big. Think of a beam coming from a laser pointer that has to focus down onto a one or two micron little waveguide slot. So here, the grating's curved. So it, it tends to diffract energy toward the waveguide to focus it, but also notice it's been apodized. And to understand why that works a bit better, think of it in reverse. We, we launch a beam this way, and at first, only a little of it couples out, but the guided mode starts to decay. So in order to keep the, the outcoupled profile looking somewhat uniform, the grading gets stronger and stronger and stronger. So we tend to get a uniform amplitude out. And it is bidirectional, and it works better for in-coupling in addition to out-coupling. And it also focuses into a, a tiny little waveguide. Another area you'll see this sometimes up on poles are slotted waveguide antennas. So we inject a signal, and we see a little coax connector here, so that would essentially launch a signal down this metal pipe. That's a waveguide and suddenly it encounters these slots. So it starts to leak out of the slots and we get this, this beam radiation from this slotted waveguide antenna. These are used a lot for very, very high power. Okay, another medium period device, something called a guided mode resonance filter, which you're already familiar with from discussions last semester. We use these for benchmarking our numerical methods. There's two physical mechanisms happening in a guided mode resonance filter that leads to that condition. One is waveguiding, and we have something called total internal reflection, where we have a high refractive index surrounded by low refractive index, or high dielectric constant surrounded by low dielectric constant. And when that's the case, we get a critical angle so we can get total internal reflection. And it turns out there's only discrete angles that will actually be supported as a guided mode. And so that's our discrete modes from a ray tracing perspective. The next mechanism we have is diffraction. And anytime we have something that's periodic, no matter how it's periodic, if we have an incoming wave, it will get chopped up, if you will, by the grating, and now its amplitude profile is, is varying periodically. So in fact, that chops up the wave, and we have can have multiple transmitted modes and multiple reflected modes. So a guided mode resonance filter is at the same time a slab waveguide and a diffraction grating. And under very special circumstances, one of the diffracted modes will match a guided mode, and we get this sort of magical resonance condition. So away from resonance, 
We have a wave that comes in. It does get diffracted, but it does not match to a guided mode. And really, this just acts like a slab of material. And if we look at the feel going through this thing, we see we just really have what looks like a plane wave. We see kind of maybe a little bit of bump when it's inside the device. But for the most part, it just passes through like it was a slab of dielectric and, and nothing magical happened. On resonance, however, we have an incoming wave. It gets diffracted into a guided mode. And now this guided mode travels along the waveguide. But like a grating coupler, it sees this grating and it slowly leaks. And in fact, it's this leaked wave combining out of phase with the applied wave that gives us an overall filtering response. So on resonance, if we plot the mode, it looks like this. There is still this wave in the background, but the field here is much more intense. So just the color scaling makes it so that we can't see it. But in the background, it does still look something like this. There's just a very strong resonant mode within the guide, and that is a guided mode in the slab. There's, we can real easily calculate regions of resonance. So these are just regions that we know there is the potential for a resonance condition. And um, basically we get this by combining a ray tracing picture of a waveguide with diffraction theory and we can plot these without actually having to get a, a rigorous solution to Maxwell's equation. But there is a lot we can learn. First of all, we know that a mode can, or a waveguide can support multiple modes. We can diffract into multiple directions. So these guided mode resonance filters can support many, many resonances. I'm only showing up to the third order, but in fact the fourth, fifth, and sixth order, it would get really busy to the left. So this white area here is a little bit artificial in that I'm just not showing the higher order modes, but it gets really busy over here. Um, very often we just want one isolated resonance, and so we, we tend to operate uh, with shorter period grading so that we're over here. As the, as the grading period gets longer, it gets more multiply resonant. But one thing we can do, we can see as the angle of incidence changes that the, these wavelengths, these regions of resonances, they shift. So if we illuminate this with normal incidence, we'll get a filter response at some wavelength. When we come in at an angle, that filter response shifts to another wavelength. And in fact, it's very sensitive to that. And if we're operating at the left side of this plot, we'll see that we have multiple resonances and multiple lines in our filter. Normally that's a problem. One of the things we're working on in our group is learning how to use those multiple resonances to sort of come together and produce one filter response that's broadband or wide field of view or something like that. So here's an animation of a guided mode resonance filter. Let me tell you what you're going to see. We have air. Here's the diffraction grading and waveguide, so that's the guided mode resonance filter, and then some kind of material below that's uh, higher than air. Here you're looking at the field, so you're looking at a plane wave that's just sort of passing through, and this is at a wavelength of about 500 nanometers. So what's going to happen, we're going we're gonna to simulate this, and we're going to look at the transmission and reflection spectra. The red line will be reflection, the blue line will be transmission. And what you'll see is, is the resonance condition met at somewhere around 550 nanometers. But watch the field. As you approach the resonant condition, you'll, you'll see that there's a very strong guided mode here. And then once you're off resonance, that disappears again. So let's watch it. I will play that one more time. So it looks like a plane wave. Now we're on resonance, off resonance, and now it just looks like a plane wave passing through the dielectric slab. So it's a very sensitive condition. Okay, on to Bragg gratings. Now we're talking about coupling modes traveling in opposite directions. So remember how we designed a Bragg grating. We had alternating layers of low, high, low, high, low, high refractive index and we made each one a quarter wavelength thick. And since the refractive index is different, the distance that gives us a quarter wavelength is also different. So the position of the stop band had everything to do with how wide or how large this unit cell was. That needs to be a half wavelength, and that determines the position of the stop band. How many periods we have tells us how deep or how strong 
this stop band will be. And the change in the index contrast, the higher the difference between these refractive indices, the wider the stop band. So the width of the stop band is controlled by index contrast. The position of the stop band is controlled by the film thicknesses. And the depth or the strength of the stop band is controlled by how many grading periods there are. So this is typically used as a reflection filter. It's band pass in reflection mode or band stop in transmission mode. So here's a movie of our illustration, a cartoon of how a, a Bragg grading works. So the red ball is the forward wave. As it's propagating, it is coupling energy into the blue balls or in other words, the same mode, but it's traveling in the reverse direction. Then eventually, there's no more energy to couple into that backward wave, so the backward wave also decays itself. And so that's a Bragg grading. Bragg gratings can do other things. We can operate them in transmission mode but near the band edge of a grating, uh, they get very dispersive. And even in their, um, in their reflection band, they also get very dis dispersive. And we can play games with this. And a bad thing that happens in optical fiber communications is that we, we pump energy down the fiber. And because the refractive index is not constant, it turns out that different colors of light, if the light has some bandwidth, and it has to because there's information on it, each one of those wavelengths travels at a very slightly different speed. So we, we put a nice crisp pulse in on one side, it travels through a whole lot of fiber, and it comes out spread. Well, it turns out we can use Bragg gratings to reverse that dispersion and sort of recompress our pulses. And that's done all the time, and that's called dispersion compensation. And that uses Bragg gratings in transmission mode, and although they can also be used in reflection mode to do the same thing. So there's different types of chirp Bragg gratings. Uh, well, the first one's not chirped at all. It's just it's a uniform grating. That's the very typical fiber Bragg grating. If we chirp them, we'll go from a small period to a long period, and that can be done for dispersion reasons. It can be done to broaden the response. We can also tilt the fiber gratings. This is done a lot to get light out of the fiber or into, more like a grating coupler. And then there's the superstructure fiber Bragg grating. And this looks similar to that fast grating I showed you for getting light out of an optical fiber when it was side polished. Uh, in the upper left, I'll mention this is how a fiber Bragg grating can be used in reflection mode for dispersion comp uh, compensation. So we inject light, it goes this way through the circulator into the Bragg grating, gets reflected, and then comes out. So in the previous slide, I showed you dispersion compensation transmission mode. That is dispersion compensation using it in reflection mode. And then the last type of thing for um, contradirectional couplers is thin film optical filters. And the idea here is that we would lay down potentially hundreds of different very thin layers and we would inject light at one side and some color or bands of colors would reflect and maybe we're also using a transmission mode where some bands or some colors would transmit and since there's hundreds of layers and we can put a whole lot of engineering into these things and and do some really remarkable things we can make some really really broadband filters really wide field of view filters we can make filters that have multiple spectral lines there's hundreds of layers, and we can tailor the thicknesses and refractive indices. There's a lot of degrees of freedom that we can use to optimize many, many different things. So this is a pretty sophisticated area in optics, and there's, there's actually a lot of tools that you can get online for designing thin film optical filters. And I've mentioned it at different times. I don't have anything here on it, but designing a thin film optical filter is very similar to designing a digital filter, particularly when the reflections from layer to layer are small. And so what does happen often is this designed initially as a digital filter and then refined with more rigorous tools to improve the performance even more.